And we're here with Dr. Bruce Huckle, professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Huckle brings us a detective story or hunter-gatherer paleoecology from the North American Paleo-Indian period. Paint me a picture. 11,000 years ago, the gigantic North American ice sheets melting. It's, it's a, a time of great change and the climate has been warming and the glaciers retreating since about 18,000 years ago. And around about 11,000 years ago, there is a really rapid shift back into very cold temperatures. Mm -hmm. And so this warming is halted for a period of about a thousand years. And the effects that we would see down here in New Mexico might not have been horribly dramatic, but most likely we would have seen more grass-rich environment. More and water for sure. More water for sure. And um, a lot of these little things that we call playas or dry lakes, they're just out on the West Mesa, um, would have held water. So it was a time when there were a lot of bison uh, on the landscape um, and other typical plains animals, probably pronghorn and people. So who were these people that were moving into the continent in this area as it was still changing? The folks that were here between around about 10,900 and 10,200 years ago are a group that we call the Folsom. We don't know what they called themselves, of course, they left no written records, but we call them Folsom because they, uh, their distinctive spear points were first recovered from a site where they had killed a number of bison uh, up by the little tiny town of Folsom, east yeah. of Raton. What do you think is important for us to know today about the Folsom people? They were around for probably upwards of 700 years. So their lifestyle, their adaptation, if you will, to this set of environmental conditions was one that was very successful. You know, today we talk about sustainable lifestyles, and this was probably a good example of a lifestyle that was quite sustainable, provided that you were willing to move frequently, cover a lot of ground. You're probably not, you know, ever occupying what we would consider to be a permanent village, but just camp after camp after camp. The other thing that's interesting about them is that they made some of the most stunning spear points that we see in all of North American prehistory. They're often out of very beautiful stone, they're most of the time very beautifully worked, what we would perhaps interpret as aesthetics, where really? they are going after raw materials that are among the most colorful, um, uh -huh. the ones that are, are, are perhaps most striking. And it may be just an expression of what they saw as beauty. It may be an expression of respect for the animals that they're hunting. As a member of a small, highly nomadic group, you have to depend a lot on your relations. Mm. Uh, for when times get tough, or maybe just when, you know, the once or twice a year, when all of the small groups that have been operating independently for most of the year come together. Uh, that would be a time when you could build and cement relations with other small groups, and that might include the trading of, of, of raw material, um, exchange of mates, um, building those kinds of social um, and to a degree economic ties that would help you be a successful hunter-gatherer. Probably better to have a, a more artistic, beautiful arrowhead to trade with if that was among the things you traded. You know? <laughs> exactly. I, I think it would probably uh, be a little more uh, desirable to have you as a trading partner if you have something that has that kind of, of impact. Tell me a little bit about the first Folsom discovery. You said that was actually northeast? Yeah, it's far northeastern New Mexico. The little town of Folsom, in 1908, there was a catastrophic flood that um, created a huge uh, runoff event. And uh, an African-American cowboy by the name of George McJunkin was out riding his horse. And McJunkin had grown up in, in Texas, and he knew what bison and bison bones looked like. And sticking out of one of these arroyos, off just a little bit to the west of Folsom was this whole array of, of bones. And he pulled some of them out, showed them around, and in his estimation they were, they were bison bones. And in addition to finding these 
bones, they also got some skulls. Hmm. And the skulls were those of what was agreed to be an extinct species of bison called bison antiquus. And at that point in time, well before radiocarbon dating, but it was generally agreed that that was a Pleistocene age species and it was probably extinct by around 10,000 years ago. Mm. In excavating this, they started finding these beautiful little spear points, wow. which became known as Folsom points. The site itself is of critical importance across uh, all of North American archaeology because prior to that time there was a huge debate about how long people had been here. And a lot of the prevailing opinion was that people had not gotten into the New World much before maybe 6,000 years ago. Hmm. And yet here at Folsom you have these spear points in association with an extinct species of bison. So all of a sudden you know, your world gets kind of turned upside down and you have to accept the fact that you have people in here at the end of the last ice age, at the end of the Pleistocene. So you find an artifact. How do you identify it as being of the Folsom period? The most distinctive thing are the, the spear points. They're called fluted points in the sense that on both sides they have one large flake that is struck at the base and driven up towards the tip and it creates this, this groove. Wow. Fluting shows up nowhere else in the world but in North America. Oh, and it has its origins with a, with a group that we call Clovis, and they are probably the ancestors of Folsom. Folsom folks take and refine this fluting technique to the degree that virtually the entire surface is the scar from, from that flute. So it really is so an they're art very form. distinctive. Yeah. They're very distinctive, and we only see those points from sites of the Folsom culture, which, as, as I said, just dates to this narrow time it's period. A slice of time, yeah. yeah. And after that, it's gone. We don't see it again. Talk to me a little bit about the recent discoveries, some things that are different from what we already knew about the Folsom. That guarantees that future archaeologists will have employment. Um, and <laughs> Always to good. Do. Exactly. <laughs> We have a lot of questions about exactly who these people were, how they went about making a living, and where they went, where, where um, within North America um, they occur. We found Folsom points from southern Canada all the way down into northern Mexico, mm -hmm. and from essentially the Rockies eastward, um, as far east as southwestern Iowa. So the sites that I've been working on that are just out west of, of Albuquerque here, have provided us with, with some, some new insights. These are the first sites within this region to be able to say, okay, yes, we do have the remains of, of bison, not horribly well preserved, but you know, in association with these fulsome artifacts. The sites out here are sitting around these very small dry lakes, playas, but they're in sand deposits. And so we're never having to excavate much deeper than about like oh, wow. this. But the negative side of it is that because, you know, sediment is accumulating so very slowly, you don't get the good preservation. Right. So all we have left of the bison are primarily pieces of the tooth uh, enamel. Is that right? And little bits and splinters of, of bone that we can say are large mammal. So the sites that we've been investigating out west of here are dominated by by raw materials that come from distances of anywhere from about 75 to, to 200 kilometers away. So we see obsidian from up in the uh, Valle Grande. We see uh, what is called Paternal Chert from up on the northern end of the Jemez. We see what's called Chusca Chert, and that comes from the Chusca Mountains that are out on the Arizona-New Mexico border. And we see uh, a material called China Chert. All these raw material sources are to the west or the north. It's pretty clear that they're moving south, but where do they go from there? We're still debating how people get into North America. Um, the traditional model has Clovis or the ancestors of Clovis coming down between the Laurentide and the Cordilleran ice sheets. In other words, up in northern Canada, as the melting begins at 18,000 years ago, the Cordilleran retreats westward, the Laurentide ice sheet retreats eastward, and they open a corridor between them. So the traditional model has people coming across Beringia and then down this so-called ice-free corridor. 
once they get south of the ice sheets, they, they appear to spread. How does Folsom culture relate to some of the Southwest, the Native American cultures, the recent ones of the Southwest? Is there any correlation between them? That's a really good question. Um, when you're talking about something that's 10,000 plus years older <laughs> than, than contemporary um, uh, Southwestern groups, it, it's really hard to establish links. Um, for imagine. an archaeologist, you know, we tend to rely on things like similarities in, in pottery or in architecture or, or in stone tools. Well, with Folsom, you have no pottery. You have yeah. no architecture. You have stone tools, but they're stone tools that are designed for an entirely different lifestyle and set of weapons. So it's really hard to say, you know, there's this clear line. Right. Having said that, we suspect that there is at least every good chance that Folsom folks have descendants in our contemporary cultures in the Southwest. Um, it may be just a very, very small sort of, of input, but if you look at it from the perspective of Native Americans, a lot of their traditional stories talk about how things were in times past before they reached the areas where they live today. And some of these, these groups talk about a lifestyle where they're subsisting on wild game, mm. wild plants, and always moving. What do you think we would have to discover to really, really know who the Folsom people were? One of the things that would be great would be to be able to find sites that have just superb preservation, a Folsom occupation in a dry cave. These people could have been superb hide workers, hide painters. So we really don't know what these people looked like. So no DNA evidence? No DNA have. evidence. I really would like to see what the people looked like because ultimately it's the people and their behavior that we're, that we're interested in as, as anthropologists. Well, maybe there's another Mr. McJunkin out there ready to make a find and, and he's riding a horseback or, or doing some digging and maybe we'll find that, uh, that really preserved site that'll offer some more clues. But in the meantime, it's, uh, it is a great mystery and I thank you for sharing it today. My pleasure, Augusta. Thanks for having me. You bet.